Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Tent of Abraham. I'm Tamir Kreisman from Jerusalem, Israel, and we continue with Perkei de Rabbi Eliezer. We're still in chapter 47. This is 47D, and this one is called Grapes of Wrath. Not to be confused by the novel by uh, John Steinbeck of the same name, okay? But I need this title. You'll understand why. Hallelujah, Adonai kol goim, shabechu kol haumim, ki gavar alenu chasdo, ve'emet Adonai lo'olam, hallelujah. Rabbi, Rabbi Eliezer says, The Holy One, blessed be he, changed the name of Pinchas to Elijah, to Eliyahu, who is remembered for good. In many places it says that Pinchas is Eliyahu, and it explains how this happened as well. You have Midrash Rabbah, Talmud Yerushalmi, the Holy Ari discusses in length in his Gates of Reincarnation, and so on. All the, everything ties together. I've given lots of classes on this, particularly in this Parsha, way back when. I think it was, what was it called? Uh, Immortal Beloved or something like that. Anyway, check it out. So um, before Pinchas slew Zimri and Cosby, thereby saving Israel and the world, he was not anointed as a priest. Only five people at the time were anointed as priests in the wilderness. You had Aaron, right? And his four sons, Nadav and Aviu, Eleazar and Itamar. Nadav and Aviv were killed in the tent of meeting as Kedoshim, as, well, I hate to use the word saints, okay, but that's what it was, Kedoshim, that's what it means. Uh, holy ones and their souls entered into Pinchas as he was doing the deed. In other words, as he was redeeming Israel. So once the deed was done, Pinchas then became anointed as a Kohen. Now he has two additional super high souls within him who helped him complete his mission. And afterwards, uh, and also, again, to basically, well, how shall we say, eternal life, if you will. And then also all during the days of the judgments of the judges as well. And then in the earlier days of the kings. So, and all this is for the sake of Israel. The name Eliyahu is spelt El-Yahu. What is El? El is, I mean, it refers to God, but El actually means strength, power. And Yahu, Yud, He, Vav, these are the top three letters of the four-letter name of God. Yud and He are the upper worlds, while the Vav is the in-between worlds, connecting the upper and the lower. The lower He, that's that's Olama Asiya, that's Malchut, that's where we are right now. So in other words, he brings everything down the funnel. And that is essentially his job, as he is a messenger between the upper and lower worlds. Any children that Pinchas had also were endowed with the spiritual strength of Nadav and Aviv, which is why God promised him, as he promised Aaron and his sons after them, an eternal covenant of the priesthood. And Pinchas particularly received the covenant of peace, which is immortality, no contention with death. Peace, okay? This is, get it, this is just a quick recap to this entire saga, okay? But we have discussed this topic many times over the years. So, the Holy One, blessed be he, changed the name of Pinchas to Elijah, who is remembered for good, um, from the citizens of Gilead, since it was by him that Israel did shuva in the land of Gilead. Where was the land of Gilead? Where is the land of Gilead? It is to the eastern part of the Jordan, where all these shenanigans went down. We can see it right after this affair in Numbers 32.1. The descendants of Reuben and Gad had an abundance of livestock, very numerous, and they saw the land of, uh, what does it say? Yazer, Jazer, and the land of Gilead. And behold, the place was a place for livestock. So remember, these two out of these three tribes, they settled in the eastern part of the Jordan. So we call the last teaching about the reason, the real reason God gave Pinchas the covenant of peace, because Pinchas had brought peace between Israel and their heavenly father, right? We discussed all this. All those that sinned terribly, idolatry, sexual immorality, he brought them back did almost the impossible, and yet he did that. And where do we see this? We'll see Elijah, again, Pinchas becoming Elijah. Where does Elijah do this in the future? Malachi 3, 23 to 24. Lo, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord, that he may turn the heart of the fathers back to the children and the heart of the children back to their fathers. 
lest I come and smite the earth with utter destruction. If he would not have done this, the earth definitely would have been smitten with utter destruction because Israel would be taken out. And the only reason the world exists is for Israel. So if you're really good at your job, then God is going to want you to keep doing it, right? Okay, so, and that's exactly what he's doing. That is what he's going to do. In fact, there was another point in time where Eliyahu played a pivotal role in returning the sons to the father and also abolishing idolatry all within the same move. This is, of course, the competition on Mount Carmel from 1 Kings 18.21. And Elijah drew near to all the people and said, Until when are you hoping, uh, hopping between two ideas? If the Lord is God, go after him. And if Baal is God, go after him. And the people did not answer him a word. This is reminiscent of Moses from Exodus 32, 26, at the incident of the golden calf. So Moses stood at the gate of the camp and said, whoever is for the Lord, let him come with me, to me, right? And all the sons of, Le of Levi gathered around to him. In other words, you have a choice. You're either with God or not with God. What's it going to be? Both leadership roles, obviously. But going back to Mount Carmel, what was the outcome? Answer me, O Lord, answer me, and this people shall know that you are the Lord God, and you have turned their hearts backwards. That's tshuva, returning the hearts of the sons to the father and the father to the sons. He did this, and he will do it again. And the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offerings and the wood and the stones and the earth and the water which was in the trench, it licked up. There was nothing there. And all the people saw and fell on their faces. And they said, the Lord is God. The Lord is God. Adonai hu Elohim. Adonai hu Elohim. This is something we're saying every morning right now for Slichot. It's a, the Lord is God, right? We're, we're confessing. We're yelling it. So they experienced shame and regret immediately followed by a declaration of allegiance and then of course a cleansing of the idols and the idolaters eliza said to them seize the prophets of the baal let no let none of them escape and they seized them elijah took them down to the brook of kishon and slew them there so just like the three thousand who kissed the golden calf with all their hearts were taken out so too were the prophets of baal and anybody who followed them but as a result of his works and his zeal, it says of him in Malachi 2.5, My covenant was with him, life and peace, and I gave them to him with fear, and he feared me, and because of my name, he was overawed. That's the translation. Okay, so in other words, clearly Malachi is speaking of Pinchas, who is Eliyahu, again, also a Kohen, a priest. And so, you know, there's a question. This is very interesting. We should know this. There's a question. Who really is this guy, Malachi? Malachi. And there's an understanding that it actually is Elijah, the messenger of the Lord, as we can read in Malachi 1.1. The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel in the hand of Malachi. Malachi literally means my angel. But Malach, although it is most of the time translated as angel, malach actually means emissary or messenger. Malachi literally means my emissary. Okay, it couldn't mean my angel, but again, malach is emissary. The entire chapter speaks about him and his job, what he did, what he is tasked with doing. Read it now again and see if you can see it throughout. It's only three short uh, chapters, and again, it's Prophecy, completely prophecy of things to come. And the Holy One, blessed be he, gave him life in this world and life in the world to come, says Pirkei Derabi Eliezer. As we can read in Psalms 106, Pinchas stood up and executed justice, like we said, Vaipalel in last teachings, and the plague was stopped. It was accounted for him as righteousness. I had to actually change this English translation because it says, ledo vado ad olam. It's the same thing, the same translation, or the, the correct translation was given to Abraham. And, and uh, what is it? Genesis 15, I believe, in Covenant of the Pieces. And Abraham believed God, and it was accredited to him for righteousness. That's righteousness. For generation to generation to eternity. 
And what do we say? There is eternity that is netzach, but whenever it says ad olam, olam means forever in a sense, but it mean, olam also means world, meaning so long as the world stands. I gave a whole teaching about this concept. Okay. So God gave Pinchas and his descendants good rewards, it says, specifically the priesthood. Whether they were righteous or wicked for the sake of the eternal covenant, as said in Numbers 25, 13, it shall be for him and for his descendants after him as an eternal covenant of Kehuna, because he was zealous for his God and atoned for the children of Israel. Amazing. So what does this mean? If a Kohen is wicked, it does not mean he is no longer a Kohen. Okay? His the fact that he is a Kohen, it doesn't get taken away from him. It depends what he does. He might be, um, the, his, uh, the actions of being a Kohen might be removed from him, but he's going to have to pay the price. He can't just say, okay, I'm not a Kohen anymore. I'll give you an example, all right? So I know several Kohanim who forewent, for, for, for go, had foregone their responsibility. For instance, a Kohen is not allowed to marry a divorcee uh, or a convert, let alone a non-Jew. A Kohen can marry a widow, though. So if that's the case, though he is still part of the Kohen, a Kohanim family, he can never serve in the temple. Not, again, in every generation. What is the mini temple today? It's called Beit Mikdash Katan, the small temples. That's the synagogues. In other words, don't you dare think that you're going to go up there or be any kind of ritually, ritually pure and raise your hands and bless the children of Israel. You can no longer do this. And just so you know how messed up the Kohanim are today, there are plenty of kosher rabbis who consider the Kohanim today to be safik, safik Kohen. In other words, okay, you say that you're a Kohen, your father, your grandfather, and so on and so forth, but really, really today, who knows? Some people definitely, you can, you can actually... Because again, a lot of the uh, a lot of the genealogy was lost, particularly because of the Holocaust. So, because so much time has passed and people have no regard for the law, that unless you can trace your lineage from father to son all the way back to the days of Aaron, and again, some people can, no one really knows who anyone is. I'll give you a story, something that just blew my mind. This was, I think, uh, three years ago. Okay, I went to the funeral a few years back for a husband of a friend of Anarina, of my wife's. So when we got there, the name of the deceased was placed on a card in the dirt because we wait at least 30 days before we put up a tombstone. But I saw that the name was Kohen, Kohen, right? In the picture. And also they, you know, how the priests, they, they, they put their fingers, it's like Spock, you know, that's where you got live long and prosper. They, they hold this and then they put it up like this, okay? They basically bring it together. Anyway, that's their business. But I'm just letting you know. So in any case, when you see where a Kohen is buried, you'll usually has the guy's name, HaKohen, and then you'll see like a, a picture of hands making this, uh, making this uh, thing. Okay, so very interesting. So I'm like, okay, so the guy's a Kohen and his sons were there. Two religious dudes. One of them was the head of a Kolel. Like in other words, the head of a... Um, uh, 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 a, a smaller study hall in within the yeshiva. And as I've taught you here, a Kohen may never enter the vicinity of a graveyard because these, com these are commands in the Torah. You cannot be anywhere near a dead body, let alone enter the vicinity of a cemetery. And yet both the sons of this Kohen were there. As we were leaving this place, we get into the car, we, we, gave some people from there a ride home. And I'm sitting there and I'm asking Anna Reno, I'm like, so wait a minute, what's what's the deal? What's going on? Because it says, now get how messed up this is. She was signaling to me because there are us other people in the back. And I was like, are you, but you, and she's like, shh, shh, shh. The guy we just buried, I didn't know him, okay? Guy we just buried, his father was a Kohen, indeed, who married a convert, thereby, foregoing all his priestly duties. The father of the guy we just buried, his, his father married a convert. A Kohen is not allowed to marry a convert by law, okay? Once this happens, he can no longer serve in the temple. If the temple would be built, 
The next day, you can't go, you are no longer, you, you carry the name Kohen, but you are not an acting Kohen, thereby foregoing all his priestly duties. He may never serve. He is not allowed to bless the children of Israel. You can't raise your hands and give the priestly blessings. As he just ended the line of Aaron and Pinchas right there with him. Done. Okay? So this guy who we just buried, I found out that he was actually acting as a Kohen his entire life. He was born. He was raised. He's like, well, my dad's a Kohen, so clearly I'm a Kohen. Giving the blessings and getting all the aliyahs, directly breaking the laws of the five books of Moses. But his sons, who learned in yeshiva, they, though they were of a Kohen family, in other words, their father was because their grandfather was, they actually carried that blood, but they knew better. And they never saw themselves as acting Kohanim because of the choices that their grandfather made. That's why they were in the cemetery. Because they're like, yes, I might have the name Kohen and the blood of, but because of my grandfather, I can no longer, I can never serve as a Kohen. My father was not allowed to do any of the things which he did. And my grandfather stopped the lineage right then and there. But these guys are good Orthodox Jews teaching Torah to other people. You see that? In a world where everyone does what they want because of how they feel, this is a world that absolutely has to be uprooted and redone properly, okay? So I'm showing you examples of people doing from all over the place, okay? I feel like I'm Israel, good for you. I feel like I'm part of this and that tribe, okay, because only Mashiach is gonna tell everybody what that, what part of that tribe they're, on, they're at. If you are even part of Israel, people don't do what they feel. That's why we have actually a book of laws. So you see Jews who do not follow it and their descendants who do. Maybe they're redeemed, their father because of what he did. Big no-no, okay? Ah, so this is one of many examples, unfortunately, within the supposed Orthodox world. I'm not painting a, a name broad strokes over here. It, this is messed up everywhere, all around, in every group, and every faction, all over the place. I'm just giving you something that I witnessed that I was dumbfounded when I realized this. Anyway, let's continue. Rabbi Elezar Hamudai says, Pinchas stood up and invoked a cherem, a conditional boycott upon Israel. So we've discussed this word cherem before. It's like a ban or a public decree, usually against an individual or a general action. For example, and we give a whole class, I forgot what it was called. But basically, let's say there is a kosher butcher. Okay, there's a Jewish town and there's one butcher, and the butcher was caught uh, dealing with non-kosher meat. So the rabbi of the community says, we are putting a cherem, a ban. We are boycotting this guy. No one from the village is allowed to buy from him, right? That's it. In other words, boom, sign sealed. It's done. It's written down here and up there. That's it. So again, Pinchas stood up and invoked a cherem, a conditional boycott upon Israel, in the secret of the explicit name of God, in other words, he took God's name and he, he sealed it with this, and with the writing that was written upon the tablets, we're talking about spiritual writing over here, the boycott included the heavenly courts and the earthly courts. Like we said, what is what we write down here is solidified up there. So what was this for? That no man from Israel should ever drink the wine of Gentiles. Okay, this, by the way, is a very strict law that Israel must adhere to till this very day. Not only that, even if it's a kosher bottle of wine, but a non-Jew opens that bottle, you are not allowed to drink from the wine. Sometimes, even if they touch it, okay, the, again, there are, it's not just, well, that makes no sense. There are spiritual implications here. And because this was a decree by Pinchas, who is Eliyahu, who is around to witness and testify, don't mess with this at all. Okay, so we know that wine is used in the most holy of rituals, but from the Sitra Achra, it is taken and used for the most unholy of rituals. But it's not only about the uses of wine, it's how and when the grapes were picked. We have very strict laws regarding giving tithes and donations 
of our crops. And by the way, I just want to say, if you're thinking to yourself right now, wait a minute, but I'm, let's say you're not, uh, not a Jew, but I'm not an idolater. Why can't you understand? Why does that apply to me? It applies to everyone who's not a Jew. Okay. That's, that's the law given by Moses. Well, given by God to Aaron, actually, you'll see. Anyway, it's in the Torah. That's the bottom line. So we have laws of uh, that go through several cycles before we can even enjoy uh, the fruit of our labor. Okay, this is how strict this is. It's not just about the wine. It's where it comes from. It's the intention behind it. We have to leave certain sections of the field open just so the poor could come and take it. There are so many laws and restrictions and warnings when it comes to the vine, particularly to the vine, because many had fallen as a result. It represents so much more than just the grape or wine, but rather the impure woman, particularly Adam's first wife. Adam and Eve fell with her. So did Noah. So did Nadav and Avihu. Any man who had ever messed with her found out. Now, this just happened again with the sons of Israel in the, Midian, in the Midianite woman's tents, drinking their wine, defecating on their idol, which is how they worshipped Baal Peor. We discussed this a few weeks ago. Lay with them, denounce God. But it all started with the wine. There is a saying, as our sages say in Masechet Iruvin, Nichnas yain yatsa sod. Nichnas enters wine, yain, yatsa, exits, sod, secret. When wine enters, a secret comes out. The numerical value for the word wine and the word secret are both 70, one and the same. But our text said it best regarding the wine of the Gentile nations. Their wine they trod with their feet, as said in Ezekiel 34, 19, and my flocks graze upon that you trod with your feet and they drink what you trod with your feet. So the question is, so what, right? Why is that bad? What do we do with our feet? They are the tools that help us manifest our intentions. They take us to the places that we want to go, be it a good place or a bad place to do something good or to do something bad. One of the prayers we have uh, when we do vidui, confession, when we beat our chests on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur is, please forgive me for using my feet to run to do evil. Right? Ritza, running, raglaim, feet, legs, lehara, to do evil. And then our text continues and says, all their wine is used for idolatry and harlotry or prostitution. Like we said, there are so many laws that we have to protect, that we have to protect us regarding the wine and where it comes from, how it's made and how it's placed. For instance, I'll give you some. You are not allowed to plant a vineyard with other kinds of fruit or vegetables. This is up to... Um, uh, uh, otherwise, sorry, this is um, up to 1.6 meters. In other words, you can't plant, if you're going to plant uh, grapes over here, you need to plant anything else at least 1.6 meters away from it. Otherwise, you make both species unkosher for consumption. The way to get around this is if you have a fence between where you plant your vineyard and the other vegetables that you want to grow, as long as it's no less than 80 centimeters tall to show a clear distinction. If it's not, the thing is not kosher, you see. Everything after its own kind, everything has to have a separation, everything has to stay in its lane, everything. These are the laws. This is straight out of the Torah in Leviticus 19.19. 19. You shall observe my statutes. You shall not crossbreed your livestock with different species. You shall not sow your field with a mixture of seeds and a garment with ha which has a mixture of shatnez shall not come upon you after its own kind. And again in Deuteronomy 22.9, you shall not sow your vineyard together with a mixed variety of species. It's even more specific. Lest the increase, even the seed that you sow and the yield of the vineyard both become forbidden. So you do this, you drink it, you're like, yeah, it's, I'm a kosher guy. This is kosher wine. You give it to other Jews. Everybody's now sinning as a result. 
Why are they sinning? It's kosher wine. Hold on. I didn't even get done halfway through what we got to do. But that's just one thing that immediately makes it forbidden. For the grapes to be considered a vineyard, they must be planted in a minimum of two parallel rows. You can't just do one. You see, even how you put them in the ground. And even after all these things and so much more have been done, you think we can just eat the fruit straight away? No, we cannot. Back to Leviticus 19, 23 to 25. When you come to the land and plant any fruit tree, any food tree, you shall surely block its fruit from use. It shall be blocked from you from use for three years, not to be eaten. Three years. You think I'm done? No, I am not. Next verse. And in the fourth year, all its fruit shall be holy, a praise to the Lord. On the fourth year, it goes to God. And on the fifth year, you may eat its fruit. Do this in order to increase its produce for you. I am the Lord your God. Right? If you do this, it is good for you. Lech lecha, lachem, for you. All these ridiculous, what do you mean? I got, I'm toiling and working this field and only on the fifth year can I eat the fruits of my labor? What is going on here? It's for you. It is all for you. It is good for you to do this. Now, this is all in Leviticus, the very book of purity that sets Israel apart from everybody else. Right? So who in their right mind would wait five years to enjoy the fruits of their labor today? Nobody. You plant it, it comes out, you eat it. End of story. Different. Economically, this makes no sense, nor does it make sense logically. It's a good thing our opinion does not matter when it comes to the laws that God gave us. But the rest of the world does to what the rest of the world does today, as an idolatrous pagans did back in the day. As our text says, all the wine of the nations is used for idolatry and harlotry and prostitution, for they take the first fruit of their vine for that purpose, idolatry and harlotry. Nobody's waiting two, three, four, five years. First year, give it to me. Our commentator said that that's how they used to do all things. Whatever they did, they would always offer the impure wine to idolatry, and then they would mix that wine within everything else they ate or they drank. In other words, this wine, this is for this pagan god. Okay, no problem. And then they take that wine that has been dedicated, and then they start distributing it everywhere to get that filth all around them, within everything they eat. You are what you eat, right? And everything they did... Now, again, you know what I'm talking about and everything that they did, all their rituals and whatnot. There are always a, there's always a negative to a positive, the evil to the good, the pagan idolatrous priests to our holy priests. What did God tell Aaron in Leviticus chapter 10? And the Lord spoke to Aaron saying, do not drink wine or other intoxicating drink, neither you nor your sons with you. Doesn't mean you can't drink. When you go into the tent of meeting, so shall you not die. This is an eternal statute for your generations. It's not forever because, again, at some point, the world as we know it, no more. There's not going to be work like that in the temple anymore. All this is for a tikkun olam, for the rectification of the world. What happens when the world is rectified? You see, so long as the world stands. To distinguish, verse 10, to distinguish between the holy and the profane and between the unclean and the clean, right? Priests, when you are serving God, don't be on the sauce. All the other pagan priests, whatever. And to instruct the children of Israel regarding all the statutes which the Lord has spoken to them through Moses. Everything that God commanded Israel to do was for the sake of separation from the nations. Do not be like them. From the system of the world, from the profane and unclean. As our text refers to this in Hosea 4.11, harlotry and old wine and new wine take away the heart. Znut, znut, harlotry, zona is a prostitute. Znut veyain, you know what that is. Vetirosh, tirosh is a grape. Ikach lev. Ikach will take lev heart. Will take your heart. In other words, wherever your eyes go, right? You shall not go after your eyes. Start drinking. See what happens. It's 
liquid courage, they call it, but that's not what that is. It lowers your inhibitions. And yet another from Proverbs 23, 20, that says, Do not be among wine guzzlers, among gluttonous eaters of meat for themselves. In other words, who do this all for themselves, not for anybody else. Now, are we not allowed to drink wine as Jews? <coughs> of course we are. In fact, we are required to. One of our, the biggest simchas we got is the Kiddush after shul, right? We drink wine, we drink whiskey, whatever. It's all good. But again, keep your head on straight. Not only was it a command in the days of the temple for water and wine libations, but today every Kiddush we say is over the wine. Wine is very, very holy but it also represents judgment, right? It's, it's red because of its color. The opposite of bread, which represents mercy. That's why when we say Kiddush first on Friday night, we cover the bread because mercy always has to go before judgment. Mercy is technically on a higher level than judgment. So because we start the meal with the wine, with the judgment, we cover the bread as to not offend it. That is right. Not offend it so the bread should not see that it's not going first, okay? And this is what we're, to, what we're supposed to do. Okay, so this is why the rules on wine are so strict, just to give you a few mentions. Because how easily can we fall off the path should we start and not know when to stop? How many stupid things do people do because they're drunk or in various different substances? Like all this, we are not only encouraged, but commended to enjoy God's creation. All of it. We know this because there is quite literally a blessing for anything that you can either see, hear, smell, eat, drink, or even behold. If you didn't see a friend of yours for over 30 days, there's a special blessing for that. If you see a rainbow, if you see, th if you see lightning, if you hear thunder, if you see rain, there, there's a blessing. If you walk by and like, man, that smells good. Wow, you say a blessing on that. There's a specific blessing. This world, we are called to elevate it. That's why there are blessings for everything. What this comes to show us is that there is an order to all things, and we are tasked with holding ourselves accountable, something that people are just not doing these days. Also, everywhere. But again, everything's written down. Speaking of, you know where we're at. This is just another reason these strict laws have been put into place. Whether we like them or not, whether we understand them or not, whether we agree with them or not, whether we feel like doing it or not, that is irrelevant. They are still there. That doesn't matter, okay? It doesn't matter what we feel, how we feel. What matters is that we are obedient to God's commands not according to our own individual understanding. We have our instructions. Torah means hola'a, instructions, how to live. But what he gave us, but what he gave to us from the days of Moses, that is what matters. That has been passed down through the ages, from generation, from generation, from teacher to student, all the way to what we have today. And the simple fact that we are here right now, talking about the Jewish people, right? Alive, the Jewish people after thousands of years of exile and persecution, even persecuted in our own land by some of the pretenders over here. This is a testament to God's word being true. And what separated us from all the nations all throughout is these ridiculous things that nobody else would ever do because why would you do this? It makes no sense. Don't do it, but we will. I know, I know we're all kind of messed up, and I know we are all but broken, talking about Israel right now, the Jews, but we carry the name of God, and he will never let us go, so long as we choose to walk in his ways, and not in our own. That's it, plain and simple. So that's our class for today. Thank you so much for joining me. Have a wonderful rest of the week, and have a Shabbat Shalom. Bye.